welcome to or welcome back to my channel. My name is Taylor. I am a third year Bachelor of Science student at the University of Melbourne. I'm majoring in psychology and I also have lived at college for the past two years. I now live in a share house, but today I thought I would answer a lot of the questions that I've been getting in my DMs. Uh, about uni and college specifically. Um, if you can tell, I am low-key in my pajamas and I thought, this is kind of a side note, but I was thinking this morning, like I just can't be bothered to put a heap of makeup on, to do YouTube, to curl my hair, like put a heap of effort into film videos. And that's I think why people burn out on YouTube because they think that they need so much to put so much effort into recording videos and to look good to record videos and so I was like stuff it I'm just gonna film like this and I'm just gonna make it more a casual chatty video I'm kind of just sick of the whole like edited thing of YouTube if that makes sense that's a bit of a tangent so sorry if you've come from somewhere else and this is your first impression of me on YouTube. That's what this, the vibe of this video is gonna be. So hopefully not many cuts, just a bit casual and chill and I can just answer your questions as if we're on a live stream or as if we're on a FaceTime. Someone said in a recent uh, vlog that I did that it feels like they're FaceTiming a friend and I loved that. So I'm just gonna keep that vibe throughout all of my videos now. Sorry, I'm looking over here because I'm trying to get up all of the questions that I have. Okay, cool. So I have done a couple of college and uni Q and A's before. Um, so I'll link those all down below. One of them was a live stream and I've also got a heap of college videos, vlogs, but also room tours, just other stuff that you might find helpful. So I'll link all of that in the description box. Okay, let's get into the college questions first. And then I've got uni and studying questions afterwards. I'm also waiting for a call any minute now for a doctor's telehealth appointment. So yeah, <laughs> I'm multitasking today. Okay, how to apply for college. So I am talking uh, about uni mob colleges. I don't know about other unis. I only applied for uni mob colleges, but basically um, it's all on their website. So you'll be able to find all of this information, but they do what's called an intercollegiate pool. So the kind of way that it works is that you choose your top, you rank all of your colleges, all of the colleges in preference order. My first one was UC. My second one was Hilda's, I think, and oh my gosh, and um, third was maybe Queen's or something. But basically, you rank all 12 of the colleges, I think there's 12 in this list. The first one you get an interview at. So I got an interview at UC. You either then get uh, accepted or rejected by that college. And if you get rejected by that college, then your application gets sent back out to the intercollegiate pool. Basically, it get, gets passed through all of the colleges that you've preferenced and they take a look at your application and if they uh, want you, then they'll have you for an interview. So this happens all the time, especially if you're applying to a college that uh, is super competitive, I guess, to get into, like they don't accept basically everyone. Um, so something like Ormond or Trinity or Queens, um, you are have a bigger chance of getting rejected from. Whereas at UC, I know that basically anyone who applies will get accepted. They don't care as much about, or I guess maybe not care is the right word, but um, they don't, you know, like they don't ask you so much about your academics or your sporting achievements and they don't accept you based on that. Whereas I'm pretty sure like somewhere like Ormond or Trinity, um, really care that they're getting students who have really high marks, really high ATARs, can contribute to the sports and all of that stuff. So when you do an application, I'm pretty sure it involves, it's all on the website, like the application portal thing. For UC, I had to do an interview and I had to do a CV letter about me. And my advice for that, if you're going to somewhere like UC, um, maybe it might be a bit different uh, if you're going somewhere else, like 
I don't know, maybe at Mormond you would want to be a bit more formal and a bit more sophisticated maybe, but at UC my one was pretty, I just tried to be personable and um, just come off as a friendly person. So I put lots of like little things in there. I said, I can't remember what I said exactly, but I said something like uh, about why I wanted to move to Melbourne and I said something about how I love coffee and how Melbourne is the city of coffee and something like that. So I probably wouldn't have said that in if I was applying to one of the big, bigger colleges because I don't know, <laughs> maybe that's just my perception, but I feel like uh, I would have focused a bit more on, I was the leader of this and I did the Duke of, like, you know, all of my more academic achievements. So yeah, it kind of depends on the college and I just, if you're writing that letter, I've had a couple of questions, people asking like what the hell to write. Just try and summarize yourself and make it in your voice. So I was trying to make it so that when they read it, they could almost hear the type, the type of person that I was, if that makes sense. So regardless of what college you go to, I think that the best cover letters, whatever they call them at, in the application process, I think the best ones are the ones that actually reflect your voice and what you want to say. So just have fun writing it, I reckon, no matter where you go, honestly. Just put what you want in and hopefully it comes across um, in a good way because they know that you're being truthful and you're a likeable person and maybe a bit of humor. I don't think that they would reject you based on your cover letter. I think it's more what I found for me at UC. It was more a way for them to pick out things that we could talk about in the interview. And that's why it really helped in the interview as well for me, having such a, um, a letter that was that reflected me so much because my um, the person who interviewed me would pick out something and I was so excited to talk about it because obviously I'd written it in there and it really reflected something that I was interested in. So I think that they're more talking points and you can't really, can't really go wrong. But in terms of the interview process at UC, um, I can't talk about the other colleges because I've only heard second-hand experiences from other people and I feel like that's not fair but at UC the interview is really really chill so don't let it stress you out I was so stressed for mine which is just the way that I am because I just kind of didn't really know what to expect for me and for everyone that I've talked to it's such a it's just they just want to know the type of person that you are so they kind of ask you like all the stuff about so what do you do like what are your hobbies um, they'll pick some more like specific questions out. We talked about in my interview, um, they asked what my favorite artist was or if I liked Taylor Swift. And then we ended up talking about Taylor Swift for like five minutes. So I think that was just a way for them to see I could um, hold a conversation. I was like, you know, just, I think they just want to know that you're a nice person basically. And there was one question, I think everyone has one maybe two questions that is more about, I don't know, mine was about conflict resolution. I'm pretty sure like what happens, um, I don't know, if there was a conflict between people or something like that. And um, yeah, I think that's just kind of making sure that you're the right person, you're the right fit. But if you're interviewing at UC, um, you interview with um, the admin staff who are so, so nice. So just look at it like, a chance to just like meet someone new and tell them about yourself and have a chat with them not so much like a formal interview okay i just realized it looks like i'm slouching so much <laughs> i'm not i'm just sitting back in my chair let me re re rejig myself okay moving on oh the next one was interview tips for college but that kind of um same thing just be yourself just answer in honesty. Okay, last one about college is about O Week at UC. Um, I think it was just what O Week is like at UC. So they are all pretty similar across the colleges, I would say. They all have pretty similar activities, but again, there's always differences between colleges and I could not talk about the other colleges because I ha have no idea what they're like. I was an O Week leader at UC and I also obviously did O Week in my first year at UC, so I've kind of seen both sides of it. 
I guess if I was to wrap it up, um, they every activity has a purpose, everything that they do has a purpose, and that purpose is to get you exposed to, I guess, as many friendships or as many people as possible to make connections to and with, and it all of the activities are designed to be fun, designed to, to just kind of let you like chill out a bit little, um, be like a bit silly and just have fun. Basically, we do stuff, oh I don't want to spoil any of it, and it also changes year to year, but you do a mix of team building activities, so you're in a group in O week, you get given um, a colour at UC, and you have three O week leaders to your group. So some of the activities that you'll do in your group and that's really good because you basically become really close or have lots of opportunities to become close with these like 12 people or whatever how many people are in the group there's a mix of activities team building activities or just group activities that you do with your o week team but then there's also other bigger activities that you do as a cohort um, that are designed to get kind of mix everyone up and just hang out all together there's also a mix of uh, drinking and sober activities so um, there's only I think at UC three drinking nights it's kind of changed because we made a week shorter due to COVID every second night is a drinking night and it, the alternating nights are a sober night where you do a different sober activity which are just as fun trust me it sounds like a cop out you know like oh We've got to do a sober night but the sober nights uh people always say that like one of the sober nights i'm not going to say what it is but it's like one of the best activities that you do in a week so it's good as well in that sense because there are people who don't drink who go to college and it's not all drinking it's not you don't have to drink you don't have to be drunk to have a good time if you are underage, which I was, or you are just don't want to drink, um, there are, in my year at least, we did, uh, we ran alternate activities if you didn't want to go to the drinking one. So we did like a movie night and we did like a Yochi trip. So we try and, well, we tried to cater to both people, but it's not, I feel like there's a bit of a misconception. Misconception is that the word? Like, that O week is just like intense drinking the whole week um, and it's just not because we know that that's that's my doctor calling I'll be one second <laughs> okay sweet done sorry <laughs> okay I can't remember exactly where I was up to but about um, how colleges how O week is this massive drinking event it's definitely not there is more sober activities than drinking activities which might be a disappointment to some but honestly like at the end of o week you are so exhausted and you, you finish o week and you have to go straight into basically semester one of your first year at uni so even though it's kind of like oh i wanted to drink the whole time it's so much better for you in all honesty because you get to the end and I just couldn't imagine if you had done any more drinking like you just would have started you just would start the semester off really poorly and then also it definitely some people think that it's easier to make friends when you're drunk or something like that but that's that's true ish but when you're looking to make like long friendships and actual connections with people doing it when drunk and then waking up the next morning and going into the dining hall and seeing 300 people and not knowing any of them because you can't remember what they look like or what their name was or what you talked about last night is not the best way to make friends so yeah they're fun a good way to mingle with everyone but yeah the sober i keep calling them sober events but i just get i guess just like the other activities that we do are just a heap of fun and it's a really fun week it's pretty exhausting because it goes um for uh five to seven days depends i don't know what they're gonna do next year but it's exhausting and it's a lot of socializing but it is so fun and it's like a once you just you know that it's a once in a lifetime experience and you'll probably never do it again so you kind of just embrace it and yeah it's a heap of fun 
Um, I guess I've talked about this before in a live Q&A that I did, but about hazing. And I can say that at UC, at least in my year, when we were O-Week leaders, we were, of course, very wary, I guess, of hazing. And we, they have a very strict policy at UniMelb about hazing. And it shouldn't happen, basically. It's not like, I think people get really stressed that you go to O-Week to be hazed. But if you are by any chance hazed at any college, it's not okay. And there you have absolutely um, a right and you should go to admin or whoever it is um, and take it further because they just like don't stand by hazing. And I know it's a really stressful thing for a lot of um, people who are looking at going to college is the idea that they might be hazed and that's just like kind of the culture, the college culture, but it's definitely not and it's definitely not normal um, and it's definitely not accepted or at least in my year it was not, I, I would hope that there was like no hazing for our O week groups and a lot of the activities even in the years between my O week and the O week that we ran a lot of them were changed because they had potential to upset people. Um, it was nothing drastic. You know, you hear really, really horrible stories from back in the day at other unis and hazing is just a really gross thing that used to be totally acceptable. But even now they are super like anything really that has the slightest potential to upset someone or be considered maybe pressure, pressuring someone is cut out of the timetable. So we lost quite a few activities from my year even to the next year because we realized that they were maybe a bit too much for some people. That's hopefully a helpful thing for me to say. I don't know, it's really hard because I can't talk about everything and I also can't talk about everyone's experience at college. I can only talk about my own. And I personally never ever felt pressured, I never felt hazed, I never felt um, uncomfortable. And when I did kind of feel like, oh, maybe this isn't for me, I had, I felt like I had those O-Week leaders who I could talk to. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking about UC and college because I could go on forever, um, but go and check out my live stream as well because I think I talk a bit more about college and O-Week in that live stream. Okay, so a couple of questions about uni and studying. First one was what was my ATAR? My ATAR was 88 point something. Um, so yeah, I worked my butt off to get that ATAR. I think the ATAR for uni Mel science at the time was an 85. So I literally did not care what I got. I could not have cared less if I got 99.95 or 85.1, as long as I got above that 85, that was all I wanted. If you're in year 12 and you're like coming to the end of it, I think people always think like, oh, I just need a high ATAR. Like I just need the highest ATAR that I can get. And I think what helped me was adjusting my, my perspective from I need, to work myself to my absolute max to get the highest ATAR that I can versus I need to work myself to a point where I know that I'm comfortable that I will get an 85, which is what I did. Like I, well, I think so. Looking back, it's a hazy time, but I think the best way to do it is be like, okay, I need this ATAR, no matter what that ATAR is, even if it's 75 if it's 95 kind of looking at that as your goal instead of I think there's always this thing of like we need a high We need the highest ATAR we can get and I don't know. I maybe I could have got a 96 Maybe I could have got a 92 I have no idea but I worked myself to a point that I was comfortable and I knew that I was gonna get all I needed to get in and I think that's an important line to draw when you're in high school and um kind of helps you maybe with like the burnout and everything and just keeping it all in perspective. You don't need the highest ATAR out of your friends. You don't need the highest ATAR out of your class. 
You don't need the highest ATAR out of your family. You just need the ATAR that will get you where you want to go. As long as you get that, then you did like the ATAR, you know, you did your job. And even if you don't, I mean, you hear this all the time, but there are so many other options. It's just not the end of the world. And it's crazy because the ATAR seems, or the HSE or whatever you do, VCE, seems so insignificant to me now because I guess like I got to where I needed to be and now I've just like erased it from my memory. I'm like, cool, it served its purpose and I'm done. And I think that's what you need to remember is that it serves a purpose, but it's not the defining, your defining number. It is not a ranking of how smart you are. It's purely just a number that helps you get to where you want to be. But even if you don't get it, you can still get there. I want to also say that the only reason I do know what my ATAR is, is because I applied to a tutoring job recently, or well, a while ago, but, um, and they said like, what was your ATAR? And I was like, I don't know, <laughs> I can't remember. I was like, I know it was like above an 85 and it wasn't above a 90, but I like had to go and find it and try and log into like the UAC or something um, and log in and find my like certificate and stuff. Because in all honesty, and I know that majority of people would not remember what their ATAR is and I know everyone says that like you just forget but you do because once you've submitted it into your thing or you know once you get accepted into uni or once it's released honestly you it's it doesn't serve any purpose anymore so yeah that's my ATAR out of if you are interested but just look at what you need for your course and don't compare it to anyone else I think that's the main thing as well um, and I obviously feel comfortable sharing my ATAR because I um, have kind of, I don't have any attachment to it. Like I know that it doesn't define me and I really just don't care anymore what it is. But I think you'd never have to share your ATAR with anyone. You never have to ask anyone else what their ATAR is. If you, like as long as you just know what you want, what you need, I would just say don't even worry about what everyone else got because they're irrelevant, they're on their own little paths and you just stick on yours. HR talk, <laughs> I just don't miss it at all. Okay, um, did I always want to do psych? I wanted to do teaching for ages, like since I was a little kid, I wanted to be a teacher. I just used to love my teachers in junior school. I just used to think they were the best things ever. And I used to just, I think I just had really good role models in primary school, especially. And I just looked up to them and I was like, I just want to be them. So I've always wanted to be a teacher. And then as I got into high school, I think it was teaching for a bit as well. I never really went into any other things. I kind of, it was teaching. And then I don't know when I realized that, that I wanted to do psychology. I don't know, actually, honestly, because I never studied psychology at school, which is the interesting thing. A lot of the people in my course at uni did psychology because I think it's a VCE subject in Victoria. It's an IB subject, but it's not a subject in the HSC. So I actually have never studied psychology before uni. Um, and I'm glad that I ended up liking it. Um, I just kind of took a, took a chance and I was like, I assume I'm gonna like this. Once I kind of looked at psychology, I kind of was like, yeah, I'll do like clinical psychology because I thought that was the only kind of option that there was. I assumed that I was going to a clinical psychologist at the time and I assumed that that probably played a part into my exposure to the role and to the job and I think I liked I liked her and I liked what she was doing so I was like I could do this like this is kind of fun. I then realized that there was more to psychology. I could go into educational and developmental psychology which kind of would have combined the teaching and the psychology thing so that was what I was most interested in when I left school. I applied to that at Macquarie. I applied to science here to do psychology, obviously, which is what I ended up doing. I applied to just like bachelors of psychology and also um, I think one bachelor of teaching maybe. I was always gonna go to uni Melbourne if I got in. The others were just kind of backup options. I'm realizing now that there's so many other pathways I can go down through psychology. And honestly, at this point, I am like overwhelmed with options and I don't know which one I want to choose, but all of them excite me, which is the best way to be. Um, and I don't have to know for another couple of years, so it's fine. But I guess going back to the question, did I always want to do psychology? No, but once I did and I stuck with it, maybe, yeah, maybe year 10-ish, 
I would say once I kind of stuck with that idea of like, yeah, I think I'd like psychology, it was pretty like, I was pretty set on doing it. How do I take notes for my lectures? So I have a video on this, which I will link in my bio, my description. I also did like a little quick tutorial in my latest vlog which you can have a look at as well. And yeah, that goes through everything. That's the method that I still use. I've tried lots of different things, but this is just the easiest method that I use and it seems to work. Okay, final question is, have I failed an assignment, an assessment and how to cope? You might hate me. I don't know. I haven't failed an assessment before at uni. I did fail an assessment in year 12. Funnily enough, I failed my extension English trial and it was because I had a panic attack thing. I don't know. I can't even remember. It was just like, I remember just looking at the page and just bawling my eyes out and I don't even know what happened. And I failed that one. I got like 37% or something because I didn't really write anything down on it. So not at uni, but there was that one time and I guess how to cope. I think I'll talk more about uni, but I guess this goes for anything. If I was to fail something at uni, the way that I would look at it, in all honesty, is okay, that's 30% of my, my grade. That's the good thing about uni, is that the things are in chunks. And I think it's important to look at a semester and at a subject. I don't know, this is just speaking generally, it might be different for every um, subject, but I feel like they try to have a wide range of assessments in a semester. Like I can think of some of my subjects where they might have a quiz, they might have an oral presenta presentation, they might have an essay, and then might have an exam. You have to remember that you aren't going to be amazing at all of them. And I think that's what I realized is that we all have strengths in different areas. So some people in my class might do so well in the essay because they're really good at writing essays but might not do so well in the exams whereas I might do better in the exams because I might be better at multiple choice um, but less at essay writing. I guess what I'm saying is that you can't look at it as a reflection of you and how you're going in the subject. I think a lot of the time you have to be like okay whatever that was if that was a an exam that I failed that's okay but I've got strengths elsewhere and I know this might be annoying but I think you also have to be like what's done is done once you get that mark back and this is what I do with all of my assignments okay that was I've done that's done and I can spend the rest of the day or the rest of the week thinking about what I did wrong and what I could have done better and all of that stuff but nothing is gonna change that mark so the only thing that you can do is focus on what you can control, which is the future, which is learning from your mistakes. If you flung to a multiple choice quiz, then doing more multiple choice quizzes so that you can build that skill set up. Or if you failed the essay, practicing essay writing or just taking the feedback on so that when you write essays in the future, you know that this is not, not a weakness, but this is not my strongest point, but what can I use to help myself like learn and that's the whole thing about uni as well is that they don't expect you to know how to do everything in the first year or the first three years the whole thing is a continuous learning process and i think that's also a really helpful way to look at it because sometimes it's with essay writing particularly i look as i look at them not as a as a way of me showing off all my knowledge and all of that stuff but as a way for me to practice my writing skills, to learn how to research, to um, practice the way that I communicate, then when I get results back and it's a number and it's, it might be annoying and it might be a bit shit or it might be really good, but the thing that matters to me is the feedback and when they say like, you need to work on your voice in the essay it's helpful and it's a learning process and i know that this might be, make people want to roll their eyes but i think if you can kind of get that perspective on uni it helps a lot because at the end of the day if you look at uni as a constant test of your ability you're not going to get anywhere you're not going to progress anywhere you're going to be constantly knocked down by any mark that you get no matter what 
Whereas if you look at it as a learning opportunity, as not a stab to your weaknesses, but instead like areas to improve on and um, new skills that you can learn, I think that's a much better way. In my opinion, have your own please because I don't know everything, but that's what I try to do. On that note, I am going to end this video here. I'm so thirsty. But thank you for your questions and I will see you in my next video. Bye!